Welcome to The Runway, where we cover current events in crypto, Web3, and tech. It's Friday, March 22nd. Let's take off. All right, guys, we've got some juicy stuff for you to close out the week. A lot has happened this week. First up, NVIDIA stock climbs as CFO says new chip to ship in 2024. As many know, NVIDIA has been the best, one of the best performing stocks over the past couple of years. Uh, just kind of soaring to new heights here because they they have the lead when it comes to GPU compute and GPU chip design. If we take a look here, it looks like they've released their B200, which is almost a new system compared to just being a single chip like the the H100 and the A100, a single base GPU. This is almost like a whole architecture. NVIDIA unveils Blackwell B200, the world's most powerful chip designed for AI. 208 uh, billion transistor chip reportedly reduces AI costs and energy com consumption over H100 predecessor. The GB200 super chip covered with a fancy full blue explosion. So it looks like they actually have multiple dyes on this chip. Usually a GPU, if you open it up, just has a single die. Here's an example of an A100 die, and you can kind of see what it looks like. I had one of these from a destroyed unit, and this is the chip that is cooled by the rest of the casing, whether it be with fans or in a server display. There's a big heat sink piece of copper around that, but this B200 looks like it actually has multiple chips on top of the board, which is very interesting. Let's move on here to our next story. U.S. government asks for court approval to sell private jets tied to Sam Bankman Freed. Damian Williams said the government sought to execute an interlocutory sale of two planes tied to FTX and SBF to prevent their devaluation. Prosecutors argued in October 2023 that the Bombardier Global Embraer legacy aircraft were subject to forfeiture due to their ties to Bankman Freed's criminal case. So it looks like Sam had these jets. That's very funny with his his whole image where he would drive around in his little Honda Civic or his little Toyota Camry, whatever it was. Meanwhile, he's uh, got multiple private jets, Bombardiers, and all sorts of stuff. Pretty wild. Next up, unpatchable flaw in Apple M series chip may allow access to encrypted data. I don't really use Apple products aside from an iPhone, but this Mac OS, some of the new Macs have this new M series chip, which is a sort of an integrated graphics and CPU all built in one. But it looks like Apple has really dropped the ball. Uh, lately when it comes to encryption and security. They used to be very well known for their privacy focused level of security and how they wouldn't let anybody hack into their devices and get in there. But it seems like they've dropped the ball on this one. Next up, Coinbase to launch Dogecoin features says Doge evolves beyond meme. Coinbase, the leading American cryptocurrency exchange, announced plans to roll out features contracts for Dogecoin, the first ever meme coin that graced the industry. The company said Doge has surpassed its meme coin origins due to its enduring popularity. Initially launched in December 2013 as a joke, Doge features an image of a Shiba Inu dog as its logo, contributing to its widespread appeal. Dogecoin's enduring popularity in the active community support suggests that it has transcended its origins as a meme to become a staple of the cryptocurrency world. The token is about to make its way to Coinbase's derivative platform, trading along other derivative products such as Nano Bitcoin futures. For many of you who don't know the genesis of Dogecoin, it was really invented sort of as a joke. And when the founder sold all his coins and left the project and said, guys, this is ridiculous, this was just a joke, the community rallied around Doge and said, you know, screw that. We like this project. We like this coin and we're going to continue to innovate and we're going to continue to develop it and we're going to take it over as a community. And they absolutely did that. And Doge has always been a project that's focused on educating people. There was a lot of events I remember many years ago where people would teach people how to use crypto using Doge. So you'd go to the event and people could tr people could send Doge and you weren't worried about losing some Doge in the same level that, that you're worried about losing something like Bitcoin, right? So it was an easy way for people to learn and learn about wallets, learn about public and private keys and to practice sending funds. They had a lot of fun with it with the block rewards. Initially, it used to spit out if you found a, if you mined a block of it, it would give you a random allocation allocation of rewards, kind of as a fun gamified cryptocurrency project. But over time, the community really grew around it and decided to make it a very serious project. But let's move on. Ethereum Foundation faces inquiry from a government. Fortune says SEC investigating ETH. After the publication of this article, Fortune reported the SEC seeks to classify ETH as a security. The Ethereum Foundation, the Swiss nonprofit organization at the heart of the Ethereum ecosystem, is facing questions from an unnamed state authority, according to the group's website, GitHub Repository. The confidential inquiry comes during a time of change for Ethereum's technology and at a possible inflection point for its native asset, ETH, which many American investment companies are seeking to offer as an exchange-traded fund. The Securities and Exchange Commission has slow-walked 
after efforts despite recently approving a series of Bitcoin ETFs. After the publication of this article, Fortune reported that the SEC is seeking to classify ETH as a security, a move that would have major implications for Ethereum and ETH ETF and crypto as a whole. The financial regulator has sent investigative subpoenas to the US companies in the past several weeks, according to Fortune's reporting. Uh, this is just disgusting by the SEC, total bullshit behavior by them. They, they've come out many times now and, and previous SEC chairs have said that ETH is not a security. There's been Gary Gensler on video saying that ETH is not a security, teaching his classes. ETH is being currently regulated. There's future markets and stuff regulated by the CFTC as a commodity. So, I mean, this is just total bullshit, waste of taxpayer money and time, funds, and uh, just another example of a regulatory agency that's just gone rogue here, doing Elizabeth Warren's and uh, Joe Biden's bidding. Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak triumphs in court against YouTube in Bitcoin scam case. Here's an interesting one. I'm sure many of you have seen those videos where they have a famous individual, whether it's Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Michael Dell, and they had just this video is just run for hours and it's just them talking on YouTube and they've got these it's like a video of their speech or something like that and underneath is like the, this this little thing is hey for the next three hours we're giving you Bitcoin or we're giving you this cryptocurrency if you we're doubling the money you send to us right and I do feel bad in a way for people that fall for that and I actually do know a couple people surprisingly who have fell for that I mean I don't understand how anybody in their right mind could think that someone's just going to give them free money but people that do fall for that I, I think deserve to get burned once or twice to learn. Uh, their lesson, right? I mean, you got to learn your lesson. Sometimes you got to learn your lesson the hard way. And it's sad to see and hopefully people don't fall for it. But blows my mind that there are individuals who could actually believe that if you just send uh, a stranger money that they're going to just give you twice as much money. That being said, there's a lot of interesting stuff in this article about YouTube's liability shield. And it looks like Wozniak was actually successful in, in piercing this 230 veil here. We've seen YouTube take a lot of action. They have no problem kicking people off the platform and censoring if it's a political narrative. But they've really allowed these scams to go for months on end. It shows here that they've even allowed these videos to stay up and given these people verification badges. Meanwhile, if you say something about COVID or something something about the election or anything that they don't like, they'll just censor you and throw you off there. So it's very strange. You know, meanwhile, they've got these scams running, people will be reporting it and they just wouldn't do anything about it, right? Meanwhile, they're focused on censoring political stuff and doing all this other other stuff that really has nothing to do with what they should be involved with. So I'm kind of torn about this lawsuit and it's probably a good thing that there's some accountability here on that front, right? If they are taking a very active role in being an editor, which, you know, 230 is kind of like, hey, we're going to, you know, we can't be responsible for what's on our platform. But as a token of the same coin, a lot of these social media companies have decided to be an editor and curate content and what they call whatever they believe is misinformation, you know, which is a ridiculous thing to say because they're not the ministry of truth. So many of these things that scientists and doctors coming and saying uh, have turned out to be very true. They absolutely Absolutely censored, whether it's the whole Joe Biden's laptop thing to certain COVID information, which they labeled misinformation or or anything along those lines, right? They are not in a position to decide what is true or not true on, on that front, right? So there should be some accountability there. If they're going to go ahead and sort of participate in, in libel or claiming someone that is providing misinformation, if they're going to act like the ministry of truth and be an editor, then they should have to deal with the same implications of that. And there should be some accountability there. The Bitcoin halving really is different this time. Four ways this April's biggest event will be unprecedented. Here's an interesting take from uh, Pete Rizzo. It's not often in crypto that you can say this time is different in good faith, but this time it really is different for Bitcoin's having slated for next month. As Bitcoin historian Pete Rizzo noted recently, this is the first time Bitcoin has rallied before the programmatic slashing of block rewards. All three prior halvings, 2020, 2016, and 2012, preceded a major run-up in crypto prices. No one can say for certain how the Bitcoin halving will affect the cryptocurrency's price. We're in uncharted territory in terms of technical analysis, whether the halving accelerates Bitcoin's run-up or terminates it is historic, and a challenge to popular belief that crypto is locked into four-year market cycles of booms and busts anchored to these events. However, there are a few other ways this Bitcoin having the fourth in the network's lifetime is already unprecedented. The context of this is, is that many people are curious. They think that if Bitcoin's rewards keep going down, how will miners still want to participate in Bitcoin when all of the rewards are gone in 100 years or when the, the reward gets so low in Bitcoin terms over the next three or four decades that it's really negligible, right? For that case, we have this concept of transaction fees. So not only do miners get rewarded with the block rewards or the inflation of the new coins that are produced, they also get rewarded with something called transaction fees, right? So the 
more the network is utilized, the more demand there is for that block space every 10 minutes on Bitcoin, the more fees are going to go to miners. And we've actually seen this explode as of late with a lot of new layer two protocols and NFT collections like ordinals and inscriptions and concepts and ideas playing out on that base layer, right? There's a lot of demand for that block space. We've actually seen these transaction fees really climbing as of late and at a very significant portion of revenue for Bitcoin miners. So the most valuable block ever, the halving will occur at block 840,000, account of how many blocks have been hashed to the blockchain. And already people are predicting that will be the most valuable block to be mined to date. This is related to the point above. Ordinals works by assigning serial numbers to individual Satoshis or SATs, the smallest denomination of Bitcoin, which turns a fungible asset like Bitcoin into something with provenance, identity, and scarcity. Runes. Because the having is such a momentous moment for the community, many companies plan launches or announcements that coincide with it. This year is no different in that regard, except what's being announced is another new token primitive for Bitcoin, Casey Rod Armor's latest protocol design called Runes, mother of all reorgs. Furthermore, because the halving block is potentially so valuable, Tristan predicts that there will be a lot of competition for miners to acquire it by any means necessary. Block 840,000 is worth at least two orders of magnitude more than any other block before it, he writes. This has never happened before, and dangling that huge money pot in front of miners will make it extremely hard for them to play by the usual rules. So this is an interesting... Uh, concept here of game theory. What this all adds up to is that miners could potentially try to front run another to acquire to acquire the block in a process known as miner extractable value. MEV. Many of you who have who know about Ethereum mining and how, how much activity was occurring on chain before they switched from proof of work to proof of stake might remember a lot of miner extractable value that was added to miners. So even though the block reward might have been 2 ETH, the MEV reward of transaction fees at some point was actually over 100 ETH, right? So for that single block, you got 102 Ethereum if you were the lucky miner who mined it or part of that pool that mined it. So interesting concept that is now coming to Bitcoin because of the activity and the excitement and the usage of on-chain transactions. Let's move on to our next story. Elon Musk releases code for his AI chatbot, Grok. Here's why it matters. The move centers on a key issue in the fight to shape AI. Some of the world's largest companies and richest people are fighting over a question that will help shape the future of AI should firms reveal exactly how their products work. Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, upended the debate in recent days by opting to release the computer code behind his AI chatbot, Grok. The move contrasts with the approach taken by OpenAI. I really do feel like we're in a, a separate reality here where it's like a company called OpenAI could really be close to AI and just like they're still calling themselves OpenAI. It just makes me laugh. Uh, the move contrasts with the approach taken by OpenAI, the company behind popular AI tech spot, ChatGPT. OpenAI, part owned by tech giant Microsoft, opted to release comparatively few details about the latest algorithm behind its products. Elon Musk did not respond to ABC News' request for comment. Neither did OpenAI. In a statement earlier this month, OpenAI rebuked claims that the company has kept its AI model secret. Sure, sure, sure. So I think it's nice to see that Elon is, you know, backing up what he's saying. He's definitely not being a hypocrite. When he initially funded and put money behind OpenAI, he was supporting what he actually believed in, which was open source AI development as a nonprofit and open source project to combat the likes of Google. Now with his new AI project, he is following through with his belief and open sourcing it. SEC sanctioned for misconduct in Debtbox crypto case. This is a big story this week. Unbelievable and illegal, unacceptable behavior by a sort of this rogue uh, agency, the SEC. They're just, destro they're just destroying any goodwill and any respect they had. I mean, this is just unacceptable behavior. Word on the street is that this isn't the first company that's been dealing with this. They've, they've, they've been doing this kind of intimidation tactics and uh, lying. I, I guess they got sanctioned by the judge here. Robert J. Shelby, appointed by Barack Obama, I believe, found that the SEC intentionally misled the court about evidence it used to obtain a temporary restraining order and freeze of debt boxes assets last August. The SEC's conduct constitutes a gross abuse of the power entrusted to it by Congress and substantially undermines the integrity of these proceedings in the judicial process shall be said in the filing. The SEC had claimed that Debtbox perpetrated a $50 million fraudulent cryptocurrency scheme in requesting the TRO, which is a temporary restraining order, an asset freeze. The SEC claimed that Debtbox had already sent $720,000 overseas and would flee to the United Arab Emirates and secretly transfer more assets if it was notified of the order. However, Shelby, uh, Shelby later reviewed his initial order and concluded that the SEC had mi misrepresented the evidence. The $700 
$120,000 transfer was actually sent within the United States. Shelby also criticized SEC attorney Michael Welsh for misleading the court and attempting to obfuscate. Welsh knew his statement from the TRO hearing was incorrect. Shelby wrote, rather than correcting this misstatement, he and the SEC attempted to subtly shift the language to gloss over and perpetuate the misconduct. Shelby ordered the SEC to pay debt boxes attorneys and cost for all expenses resulting from the SEC's conduct. So if uh, if you're curious about who's going to be paying for this, guess what? You're going to be paying for it with your tax dollars. So we get to finance the SEC, uh, the SEC's gross misconduct and fraud essentially here um, by lying to the courts and making stuff up so they can abuse their power. Um, so the, the US taxpayer is actually going to be on the hook for this. Fantastic, right? Not to mention the salaries and time, time wasted uh, with all of this literal nonsense from the SEC. I mean, this is completely unacceptable. And any, if this was a company, if this was a business, if this was literally anybody, um, there would be consequences here, right? I mean, and this this clown, this Michael Welsh, whoever works, this SEC attorney, I mean, this guy should be disbarred. I mean, this is just unacceptable. And hopefully nobody hires him. He really needs to apologize to everybody. I mean, this is just unacceptable. The SEC needs to apologize. I mean, this is total bullshit is what this is. Um, and it's, it's disgusting to see my tax dollars and your tax dollars go into this. It's just terrible for the US too, because you know this industry is going to bring trillions of dollars of wealth. If it's not going to be in the US, it's going to be in the EU. It's going to be in, in Asia. It's going to be developed somewhere, right? So this type of behavior and stuff is just very anti-American and it's just bad for America, bad for the taxpayers, bad for the citizens. And it goes against every single mandate of the SEC, uh, fish and capital markets, all, all three of their mandates. So let's move on here. We're going to do our X Factor takes. Mario Nafal here. 1.2 trillion spending bill dropped at 2.30 a.m. with over 1,000 pages. The 1.2 trillion omnibus spending bill merged smaller bills into one, allowing a single vote for, per Congress House to fund the government for a year. However, it's a beast at 1,000 plus pages and less than 24 hours to read. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, the minibus was released at 2.32 a.m. and is 1,012 pages of 1.2 trillion taxpayer dollars. With the super scary government shutdown deadline threat looming tomorrow at midnight, it takes 27.8 hours for the average reader to read 1,000 pages. How fast can you read? Every single member of Congress should have to read the bills that they are they are signing off on. Um, you know, the fact that they push this stuff through and nobody really reads it, nobody knows what's going on. It's just it's it's just honestly it's fucking bullshit. There's really no accountability here. There's no check on on this type of um, all of these bills should be read by the people voting on them. And if you haven't read the bill, you shouldn't even be voting on it. Uh, you know, how can you how can you put your name behind something that you haven't read? It's like signing a contract that you just haven't read. And a follow up on that, we are in the looting stage of the empire collapse, wherein the elected leaders of Abandon any notion of austerity and take as much as they can as quickly as they can. 35.7 trillion and counting total U.S. debt. That's an interesting take here. Honest question, why pay taxes if they just print more? The answer to your question is because they will violently take you to jail um, and uh, they will cage you like an animal. Here's a message from uh, Jack Mallers announcing Strike Black, our suite of products and tools for developer looking to build on Bitcoin. Easily integrate and offer Bitcoin. Buy, sell, send, receive, hold, withdraw, on board, cash in, and cash out. You can get started for free today. Strike.me slash black. So uh, nice to see Jack doing great things for the Bitcoin world and good shout out to a successful entrepreneur who does a lot for the community. Twitter take here uh, from Elon. Google is deeply infected with the woke mind virus. Holy shit. Google just quietly changed its search results for bloodbath definition. I mean, this is just par for the course. Uh, this is why I don't support uh, Google. What they do is just really unethical. And here's just an example. I mean, I'm just changing definitions in the dictionary. <laughs> it's just, just absurd. They've done this a lot. They just go and change the definition of words to, to, to suit a narrative, right? It's like uh, they've done this with words like racism and all sorts of stuff to, to they just bend it to their narrative. And it's just mass psychosis, mass social engineering. Sadly, the fact is most people have no idea what's going on underneath the hood and there's really no accountability for this. Sam Lehman, if Gary looks slim, it's because he's been eating nothing but his own words since 2018. And here he is live basically saying that Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, why did I name those four? They're not securities. So They're here's impeaching his little, his little MIT class. We'll get him on the record here. 70% of the crypto market is Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash. Why did I name those four? They're not securities. 
Three quarters of this. I mean, this is, is like not security. This is like a fucking joke. Over- I, ho- I hope somebody takes this to court and just plays this video of, of uh, right from the horse's mouth. This is an example of an individual who's literally sold his soul to the devil, right? I mean, it's like he is literally got placed in a position of power, and you know, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? So I don't know how he sleeps at night. This is a guy who's actually educated on the subject matter. He knows what he's talking about. He taught a class at MIT, and yet here he is uh, being an absolute hypocrite and basically being uh, Elizabeth. Warren's peon doing whatever she tells him to do. Uh, I mean, this is just someone who's basically sold their soul. Many of us had such high hopes for him when he came into office, right? Um, I was somewhat happy. I said, okay, this guy understands the industry. He knows what he's talking about. Like, he's going to be good. I thought, you know, there's a there's a great hope here. Like, this guy has potential, right? This is what we need people who understand and are educated on the subject matter and in these positions where they can operate and help, right? And help guide a public policy for the greater good of America and for the greater good of people, right? But he's gone in and done the absolute opposite. And basically, this guy should be called out and he should be held accountable. There's really no accountability. And this is why you have the other members of the SEC board openly mocking him in their dissent letters. Hopefully, we'll see some serious change in the next election cycle. At this point, the only two options are RFK Jr. or Donald Trump to, to see that, right? Those are the only two acceptable options for the Web3 and crypto industry. Let's move on to our next take. This is kind of funny. New Greenpeace USA got exposed by community notes for spreading FUD against Bitcoin. You come at the king, you best not miss. So here's a little community notes here. Greenpeace USA just released an explosive new report exposing the deep. And here it goes. Readers added context. Greenpeace USA was paid $5 million by the creator of Ripple to attack Bitcoin. Uh, it's too funny. Justin, Coinbase CEO, says they're a custodian for the around 90% of US spot Bitcoin ETF assets. First off, I'm going to say, full disclosure, I own Coinbase stock. I think that you know they're doing fantastic. They're doing a lot of good things. I think they're one of the examples of a great company in crypto doing great things for the community and running a profitable and excellent in business. And that, that's being reflected here where most of these ETF assets are trusting Coinbase as their custodian. Now, do I think this is a systemic ri- risk? I absolutely do. I think that we need to spread out the, the custodianship of these assets, right? There are other companies and other like places like companies like Kraken uh, that can that should be able to get involved with this. Other companies like Unchained, I think they're mentioned down here. And this is what the Bitcoin magazine says. A single company should never be able to lose your Bitcoin. Eliminate single points of failure, stack directly to cold storage with collaborative custody by Unchained. So collaborative custody is another way to look at this, right? Where there's multiple essentially uh, sharded keys where two best two out of three can open it. So it's not just one individual that could lose it or one company. Now, I think Coinbase is an excellent company. I just think this is a potential point, And this might be a contrarian take to have only one company uh, running custody for you know 90% of all the US spot Bitcoin ETF assets. I think that is an issue. Bitcoin Magazine, is they're posting another point here that you, know, you want to take self-custody or collaborative custody, which is another uh, mechanism. And I'm sure Coinbase is doing an excellent job. And they're in a whole another caliber as a publicly traded company than many of the other companies we've seen come before. But I do think that we should see more than just Coinbase acting as a custodian. I'm going to go a step even further and say that a lot of this is the fault of the SEC itself with their SAB 321 or 521, maybe it's SAB 121, something along those lines, whatever rule that they've essentially overextended their power and authority to basically put out and say that banks are not allowed to participate in custodianship of these assets. I think they are part of the problem here that no other banks, no other entities can participate, right? So they are in and of themselves. The SEC is creating a systemic risk here. Uh, and I think this is very problematic. And somebody needs to call this out because it shouldn't just be a crypto, a crypto company that one crypto company that should be custodying all these assets, right? We should banks and other entities should be allowed to participate in custodianship, right? We should have a diversification of custodianship. And again, the main takeaway here is the SEC is a large part of the problem. And here is a take from IMDC Investor. In my honest opinion, Coinbase went from slightly flailing with the FTX fake game of attention competition last cycle to firing on absolutely every cylinder this cycle, moving on chain fast to the point where base will be a preeminent L2 and likely a technology leader, which should keep giving back to the open source ecosystem. Highly attentive and responsive to customer feedback, willing to take concerns about supporting network health seriously and the dominant force in fighting crypto regulatory overreach in the US while others folded. No doubt, this is all took tremendous leadership from Brian Armstrong and others. Great job. I am glad to be a shareholder and a customer. And what I said previously, nothing against Coinbase. I am also a, a uh, you know a shareholder uh, and a customer, right? So f- on a personal level, got family, friends. I refer tons of people to their exchange and, and to use them on a business level. Uh, my business you know uses their exchange as well. 
So huge fan of Coinbase. And I think that this tweet is, is, is very accurate, right? So let's move on. X factor. So here Elon uh, touches on this. This article understates the magnitude of the problem. Google interferes to help Democrats thousands of times every election season. This to be is to be expected when their censorship, aka trust and safety teams have far left political views. So really no surprise there. But I think whether this is a company that thousands of people think they're getting neutral, unbiased information from, whether they were interfering on the, from the right or from the left, it shouldn't really matter. I mean, it's just really unacceptable behavior and unethical behavior, right? Because again, this is very deceptive. This is a deceptive, pra uh, deceptive practice. And I think this needs to be quantified. And this is a, if these companies want to, to give this away, it should be, be a political contribution or a donation, right? So how valuable really is the social engineering that they're doing? How valuable is it uh, that them changing definitions to fit certain narratives? How showing people what we call ephemeral experiences that you can't really track or ever see that they actually did, you know, misleading people, telling a certain people, using people's private, private data to socially engineer and manipulate them. And, you know, we should try to quantify this and this should be an elect, this should be a campaign contribution. And here, Dr. Robert Epstein has done a lot of research on this. And a lot of people are just starting to wake up to this and figure out what's happening. And it's why I refuse to use Google products as much as possible. I don't use their search engine. I don't give them my data. Here, Robert Epstein says, exactly, Elon. Musk. The real number is much higher. I've been investigating the issue in rigorous research since 2013. My most recent congressional testimony is at 2023 epsteintestimony.com. It's a six minute video. So he has a great little testimonial clip here. Let's move along. Cypherpunk legend Hal Finney reflecting on his life and legacy in Bitcoin at $100 exactly 11 years ago. One of the most moving posts you'll read. I've read this many times. It really talks about how he got first got involved with the community and the cypherpunks and with Bitcoin and how he was one of the first users with Satoshi of Bitcoin. And he discusses all this. And um, it's kind of sad because he got ALS and he just kind of got it basically became paralyzed and was barely able to function. So this is a very sad read. And this is kind of he wrote this in the last couple of years of his life. But it is a interesting historical artifact to review if you're interested in Bitcoin and learning more about its origins. The fiat hawk, like this guy. The U.S. government is currently confiscating $1 trillion of USD of wealth every 100 days. Why deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth. Save in Bitcoin where your wealth cannot be confiscated or diluted. This is a cool AI-generated uh, outtake here with a little image. Here's Pomp. The U.S. has been tanking in the world happiness rankings. Finland, Denmark, and Iceland continue to dominate the rankings. So I think this is, uh, when you ask yourself, were you better off now than you were four years ago? I think this is the chart you need to look at. I am curious what metrics they use to calculate this. If you look at places like Israel, you can see over the past year, um, they might be taking into account the war and the uh, terrorist attack and uh, the fact that they're at war doing all this stuff here. So you can kind of see that Israel has gone down in that ranking. So this is interesting. I would like to know their metrics. And over the past year, Costa Rica has been down and then up. <laughs> so there's some interesting outliers and things to look at here. PaulGrewall.eth. The commissions above discuss above discussed conduct constitutes a gross abuse of the power entrusted to it by Congress and substantially undermined the integrity of these proceedings and the judicial process. The operation of the American judicial system rests on the fundamental proposition that every party who comes before the court is bound by and adheres to the same set of rules. So this is just going over the order by that uh, Obama appointed judge, Robert J. Shelby, in the state of Utah, calling out the SEC and exposing their illegal and unethical behavior. That we've talked about already. Coinbase Derivatives LLC quietly filed certifications with CFTC to list U.S. regulated features for Dogecoin, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash. They filed them on March 7th, and surprisingly, nobody seemed to notice. Futures are set to start trading on April 1st if there are no objections from the CFTC. Elon Musk, good day for Doge, a Doge connoisseurs, a stepping stone to, to Doge futures ETF. Study CTF, CFTC lessons in that. That's very interesting. I know we did kind of talk about this a little earlier when we talked about Coinbase's and their futures contracts. Let's look at a take from James Safart. Wonder if the SEC objects to these being classified commodities futures versus securities futures. These are all forked from Bitcoin, so these are securities claims would be hard to make after spot Bitcoin ETF approvals. Might be why Coinbase chose them. Interesting take there. Here is Ram Aluwalia, and he's got some excellent uh, threads and takes and contrarian viewpoints. SEC versus Ethereum, the SEC is priced in. Look at ETH, up from 3,200-ish, low yesterday. Now look at this headline. SEC probing crypto companies in Ethereum investigation has hopes for ETF DIM. The regulatory status of Ether has a long been a point of contention for the Security and Exchange Commission. Uh, this guy just absolutely disgusts me. Pierre Richard, 
Bitcoin is the most effective way to protest. I like that. I agree with it. Dennis Porter. I'm going to leave you guys with this one. No one will ever convince me that I should stop working with conservative or liberal groups to find common ground on Bitcoin. I'm not afraid to work with the left or right to ensure Bitcoin succeeds in the USA. Bitcoin is for everyone. Bitcoin will unite us. I love that take and I think it's excellent. And with that, guys, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe, stay blessed, never stop learning and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening.